Fighting on the Seven Mountains. First, let me start by explaining the Seven Mountain Mandate, in case you haven't already heard it. God has prophetically shown the church that a nation is guided by seven mountains, or seven spheres of influence which shape a culture. These seven mountains of influence are education, religion, media, arts and entertainment, business, government, and family. Here's a short video explaining the seven mountains. In every city of the world, an unseen battle rages for dominion over God's creation and the souls of people. This battle is fought on seven strategic fronts, looming like mountains over the culture to shape and influence its destiny. Over the years, the church slowly retreated from its place of influence on these mountains, leaving a void now filled with darkness. When we lose our influence, we lose the culture, and when we lose the culture, we fail to advance the kingdom of God. And now, a generation stands in desperate need. It's time to fight for them and take back these mountains of influence. The mountain of government, where evil is either restrained or endorsed. The mountain of education, where truths or lies about God and His creation are taught. The mountain of media, where information is interpreted through the lens of good or evil. The mountain of arts and entertainment, where values and virtue are celebrated or distorted. The mountain of religion, where people worship God in spirit and truth or settle for a religious ritual. The mountain of family, where either the blessing or a curse is passed on to successive generations. And the one mountain they all depend on, the mountain that fuels and funds all the other mountains. The mountain of business, where people build for the glory of God or the glory of man, where resources are consecrated for the kingdom of God or captured for the powers of darkness. Those who lead this mountain control what influences our culture. The last 50 years, we've seen the most rapid moral decline in history. The culture we inherited from our forefathers is disintegrating before our eyes. What kind of world are we leaving for our children and grandchildren? As long as the business mountain is held by enemies of the gospel, funding for the other mountains will always be constrained, and any efforts to advance the kingdom of God will be hindered. Imagine God's people reclaiming their cities in government, in the arts and entertainment, in the media, in education, in the family, in religious influence, but only limited by their imagination and not by a lack of finances. It's possible, but first, we must take back the mountain of business. It is time to reclaim the seven mountains and bring the life of God back into our culture. Take, for example, the mountain of media. This is a very important mountain because it shapes how a culture looks at reality. The media can make a bad thing look good or a good thing look bad. The mountain of media contains several smaller mountains of influence, such as internet, TV, newspapers, radio, magazines, etc. And there is fierce fighting on this mountain, with both sides trying to capture the hearts and minds of their audience, either for light or for darkness. Simply put, the enemy has his people strategically placed in media, and the Lord has his people 
strategically placed in media. Like a giant chessboard, where each side is fighting for position. And the higher a person climbs on this mountain, the more people they influence. The Bible says that in whatever you do, in whatever field you're located, in all your ways acknowledge God. So, whether you bake cakes, build ships, or report the news, you want to do everything in a way that honors God. So let's begin by looking at some of the battles raging on each mountain. We'll start with the mountain of business, or the marketplace, and see if light or darkness is influencing this part of our culture. Here are some good examples of how business can bring light to a culture. By companies donating to charity and feeding the hungry. Or by giving their patrons the ability to donate. This action honors God and advances his kingdom in the marketplace. On the negative side of business, let's look at job cancellations. Here are several examples of Christians getting fired from their jobs because of their faith. Left unchecked, the marketplace can become hostile to Christians who dare to hold firm to their beliefs. Let's look at fashion. Here are two shirts sold in the marketplace. One has a demonic picture of a skull and the other has a picture of the cross. Which one would you wear? Do you want to advertise for heaven or advertise for hell? And again, here are two bags sold in the marketplace. As you can see, their symbols have very different meanings. Would you want to walk around with the face of a brutal communist executioner on your body? Or would you rather show people a symbol of freedom? In the area of jewelry, here are two necklace designs. One of them honors an idol, and the other honors the marriage commitment. Where I live in China, the marketplace is full of idolatry and you need to be very careful with what you buy. Many people choose to get tattoos on their body. And this is another area that can either give glory to God or glory to the devil. Why would anyone want to walk around with an evil picture drawn on their skin is beyond me. And unfortunately, at this time, Many tattoo shops specialize in dark, morbid, even demonic artwork. This is one industry that really needs God's light. Let's take a look at swords. I personally like collecting swords. I find them very beautiful. Except that 90% of the ones I see in the store have evil, demonic, devilish faces engraved on them. In fact, it's hard to find swords with anything noble engraved on them. Now, let's switch over to the mountain of religion and see what battles are raging there. Here's a story of a best-selling author and pastor named Rob Bell, who preaches that there is no hell and that God has ordained gay marriage. Clearly, the church needs to take a stand and not let pop culture rewrite the Bible. One area that the church is having good success in is prison ministry sharing the gospel with the incarcerated. Many of the people with the highest calling of God 
are currently locked up in prisons. The enemy targeted them when they were young to prevent them from ever maturing. But once set free, they have the ability to do great damage to Satan's kingdom. Truly, prisoners are the treasures hidden in darkness. Christians need to continue to reach prisoners with the good news of Jesus. One of the big struggles in the church today is whether we're going to support or oppose Israel. Whether we believe God's covenant with the Jewish people is still valid or not. This issue has divided the church with several congregations siding against Israel and many more siding with Israel. The church must not keep quiet on this issue but must make a bold stand with Israel and oppose efforts to divide up and give away their land that God promised to their people. By far, the biggest struggle in the church is the natural versus the supernatural. Whether a congregation follows God by ritual, form, and tradition or by being filled and led by His Spirit. Whether a congregation is serving God by their own strength or by God's strength. Whether a congregation actually knows God or just knows about Him. The fight between the natural and the supernatural, the flesh and the spirit, is one of the oldest and most important battles that the church is in. Now let's look at some of the battles waging on the mountain of arts and entertainment. Why is this an important mountain? Because the Bible says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And often in our current culture, we see things in movies, books, media, or games that seem to promote darkness, even glorify it. And conversely, the things of God are often belittled and ridiculed in our culture. For example, here's a very popular movie series watched by countless millions of children. In the Harry Potter series, Witchcraft and sorcery are glorified and shown to be cool. It's one of the worst lies of the entertainment industry. Telling children that not all witchcraft is bad, some witchcraft is good. That's like telling kids not all demons are bad, some demons are good. Thankfully, many great Christian movies have started coming out, giving moviegoers a choice of family-friendly videos. With tens of millions of people watching movies each week, it's important that the church not abandon this mountain. Here is an interesting question that has a surprising answer. Do you think that there's too much sex shown in Hollywood movies. You may think the answer is obvious, but it's not. To find out, answer this question. How many movies can you name where sex is shown between married couples? Wow, not very many. It's hard to name even a few. Now, isn't that strange? With thousands of R-rated, sexually graphic movies being released, hardly any of them show sex within a marriage commitment. Why not? So you see, there's not too much sex shown in the movies. There's too much adultery and fornication shown in the movies. Sex within a marriage is based on commitment, loyalty, faithfulness. It's treated as sacred. 
but adultery and fornication are not sacred. There's no real commitment or loyalty. It's based on lust, the passion of the moment. Take what you need, and when you're done, you throw it away. It's disposable. And this is how Hollywood portrays sex. They treat it in the same way that a dog treats it. Put two dogs together, and five minutes later, they're going at it. With dogs, there's nothing sacred about it. I always liked the movie series called Star Trek. In this series, Captain Kirk is the hero. He's brave, he's strong, smart, fast, and a great leader. All the qualities of a hero. Except, sexually, all his relationships are disposable. No loyalty, no marriage, no commitment at all. In the movie Into Darkness, he jumps into bed with two alien girls, and when finished, he just leaves them. Just like a dog. What a horrible role model. Women are to be used, and when finished, we simply discard them. Now let's look at the industry of music. Music is a very interesting battleground. This is an industry full of both light and darkness, with many groups promoting outright sin and other groups singing the praises of God. Music really captures the heart of the listeners and can have a profound effect for both good or bad. The church really needs to pray for this industry so that music can be a blessing to the culture and uplifting, not a curse. Let's look at painting and art. Artwork can convey messages to the beholder, either for good or bad. Here are two pictures. One shows the beauty of rural life, and the other shows the grotesqueness of death. Which one would you want on your wall? Or take these two pictures. One shows the beauty of God's creation, and the other shows the meaningless, random abstraction of some artist. Now let's look at video games. Tens of millions of kids play video games each day. And this is one area that is dominated by darkness. If the church wants to impact the culture, we really need to give kids an alternative to the violent, grotesque, and even demonic themes that saturate the video game industry. Now let's look at toys. I recently went through a toy department in my neighborhood and found something very disturbing. Almost every toy figurine was a grotesque looking demonic creature with fangs, horns, bats wings, and bestial strength. Of course, they weren't called demons, they were called aliens. But it was clearly just a clever way of introducing demonic beings to little children. Christians must not neglect this arena of our culture. And we must always strive to protect the innocence of our children. And for our last example on the mountain of entertainment, let's look at TV. The TV has a tremendous influence on shaping our culture. Here's two TV series. On the left, you can see three beautiful vampires. They're made to look cool and sexy. Now, when I was young, vampires were the bad guys. But now, they're the heroes. This just shows you how quickly darkness has crept into the TV industry. Which is why many Christian families don't even have a TV in their house. Now there are some good wholesome shows on TV, but clearly we have more work to do. In the battle for our culture,
TV is one area we can't afford to neglect. Now let's switch over to the mountain of government and see what cultural battles are waging there. in the arena of courts and law. Here is an example of a court trying to make it illegal to teach anything but evolution in the schools. Making evolution the only theory that needs legal protection. Why should the courts tell schools what they can't teach? Now you see why it's so critical that we elect wise and prudent people in the courts. In another court ruling, the Supreme Court legalized abortion in America in 1973. Since then, we've had almost 60 million abortions in America. That's almost twice the population of Canada. This is one battle that the church has lost, and it has cost us so much. We can't afford to lose these battles. We need to stand up and fight for justice and raise up godly judges in America. On a positive note, here is an example of how government can have a good influence. Military chaplains are allowed on bases to pray for and share God's word with our soldiers. It's always good before our soldiers are sent into dangerous situations to have God's blessing, wisdom, and protection. But we must now fight to prevent the military from demanding that the chaplains water down their messages. Now let's look at some of the fighting on the mountain of media. The media represents the eyes of a nation. And when the eyes are bad, the whole nation goes into darkness and many battles are either won or lost based on how the media informs the public. One of the areas on the mountain of media that the church has had some success in is Christian radio and TV. With uplifting music, scripture readings, straight talk and family-friendly programming, millions of households are already being reached with the light of God. In one area that I visited, anyone flipping through the radio stations couldn't help but hear anointed praise and music. But unfortunately, the mainstream media is often hostile to Christian values. In many studies of the media, it has been shown that the people working for the media are approximately five times more likely to be atheist or agnostic than the general public, and approximately six times less likely to attend any type of church than the general public. And this causes all types of anti-Christian biasness in the media. This affects what issues are covered and what issues are ignored, how things are labeled, who's given credibility, and whether things are shown in a good or bad light. For example, I remember each time I'd see a news report concerning some church. The report would never show any real preaching about Jesus, but it would always show the church asking for money, trying to make churches appear like some greedy corporation. This is a good example of how Christianity is shown in the mainstream media. Here are several beautiful people shown on magazine covers. But one cover is showing an angry looking person with the title Madman. Now try to guess which picture is the Christian and which ones are gay. This is how the mainstream media show some things in a good light and other things in a bad light. 
Though the internet has many good things to offer, internet pornography is by far the worst. Pornography is a major stronghold of Satan, which has entrapped hundreds of millions of people worldwide. It has ruined marriages, broken families, even addicted young kids. Christians need to be diligent in pushing back the darkness of internet pornography, or we'll lose this generation. Now let's move over to the mountain of education and see what battles are waging there. This is a very important mountain because it has tremendous influence on our future generations. Over the last half century, we've seen a concerted effort to remove Judeo-Christian values out of our schools. Removing the Bible, removing prayer, removing any mention of God, even removing the Ten Commandments. And the reason people try to remove Christianity out of education is so that it can be replaced with an alternative worldview, one which is hostile to Christian values. This hostility that is present in several universities has caused many students who are not well grounded to lose their faith in Christ. For this reason, many parents have chosen private schools or homeschooling for their children. And the fight for school choice, giving parents the option of where to send their kids, is an important step in reforming our schools. As Christians, we need to keep praying for our schools and getting involved in all aspects of education so that our schools and universities can be places of enlightenment, morals, discipline, and a good education, not ignorance or secular indoctrination. So in conclusion, we've seen several different battles on the various mountains of our culture. And I hope this has shown you that the struggle for our nation is fierce and Christians always need to be diligent in fighting for our country. Otherwise, we'll lose the seven mountains and watch our nation fall into darkness. One of the reasons we've lost territory on several mountains is because of the isolationist mentality, which tells the church to stay out of other aspects of society. But Jesus said, you are the light of the world. If Christians aren't bringing light into the other mountains, then we're failing our commission. Now let's look at some examples of success, where people working outside of any church have successfully influenced their area of the culture. The Passion of the Christ film was a major hit, becoming the number one R-rated movie in U.S. history and the highest grossing non-English film of all time. Why? Because one man who wasn't working for any ministry was in the right place at the right time. And in making the film, he reached more people than a thousand churches could reach. Here's another example. Football player Tim Tebow simply writes a Bible verse under his eyes. And after the game, Google reports 94 million hits of people who looked up that verse. Truly, sports heroes can have a tremendous influence on our culture. As our final example, here is the story of Olmos Prison, one of Argentina's worst, and how just one man can make a big difference. Olmos, Argentina's biggest maximum security prison, home to 3,000 of the nation's most dangerous criminals. 
locals recall a time when this was a fortress of fear, the epitome of evil itself. Terror and misery reigned here supremely until the day that grace and mercy showed up. In the mid 80s, one man's obedience to God triggered a turning point in the history of Olmos, giving rise to a groundswell of transformation that years later would challenge the entire penal system of Argentina. Many pastors think that we are weak Christians and in need of ministry, but we indeed strengthen ourselves in God's Word. We pray and minister to each other continually. We also minister to our own families and others that come here. We are the pillars in our families. Prisoners are not locked up in their cells. The standard iron bars have been replaced with bright orange curtains, allowing for unprecedented freedom of movement. In various of the job creation workshops on the premises, prisoners are trusted to work with an unusual range of instruments, prohibited in any other prison. Even if there were the slightest argument, someone would get hurt. Here we move in freedom and work with dignity. We are able to earn money for our families, to help them to pay their bills and also to have enough money so they can visit us more often. Despite these special privileges, Unit 25 has seen zero attempted escapes. Now let's talk about solutions and strategies. What can you do to make a difference? One solution is by voting with your money. By giving preference to godly businesses, people or institutions and not sponsoring or buying anything that promotes evil. In this way, markets will automatically adjust to where the money's going. Another solution is that whichever of the seven mountains you're working on, no matter how dark it currently is, you strive to bring God's light, God's anointing, and God's presence to your area. And remember Galatians 5.9, it only takes a little yeast to work through the whole batch of dough. Another solution is the voting box. As the Bible says in Proverbs 29.2, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Therefore, it is very critical to elect godly Spirit-led people into office. But it is also important to vote the wicked out of power. Believe it or not, a key solution to many of the world's problems is God's judgment. Not wrath, but judgment. One person said it like this. God's judgments are like a lawnmower, which cut down the proud and lofty grass but pulls up and straightens the meek and humble grass. When God's judgments come, the wicked lose power and influence. In other words, they go down the mountain. But also with God's judgments, the righteous are exalted and move up the mountain. In this way, the high places are captured by the Lord and the enemy is driven out. So praying for God's judgment in an area is not something to be feared and avoided, but something to be welcomed. The Bible says that the tongue has the power of life and death. So we must use our tongue to bless the things of God's kingdom and against Satan's kingdom. For me, this means that if I'm going past a business that I believe is harmful to the community, like a strip club or a prostitution house, I will make prophetic declarations against it. For example, I declare that this place shall go out of business and be removed. May nobody solicit this business. 
I declare that the employees will get saved and change careers in Jesus' name. But if I'm passing a place that I believe is a godly institution, benefiting the community, I will pronounce a blessing over it. May the Lord bless and protect this institution. May it be fruitful and successful. May the will of the Lord be accomplished here in Jesus' name. So once again, here are the five strategies we've covered for influencing the seven mountains. Number one, voting with your money. Number two, voting at the ballot box. Number three, bringing God's presence into your area. Number four, praying for God's judgments. And five, pronouncing prophetic declarations and blessings. In this way, we can reclaim the seven mountains and bring our nation back to God. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this video presentation of the fighting on seven mountains. I'll now leave you with some discussion questions to see what your part is in this cultural war.